All right, let's begin by turning to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. Are y'all too cold? I might turn the air just a little bit. <laughs> Did you hear that response? Yeah, yeah. No, no. Turn it up, turn it up. No, turn it down, turn it down. Joshua is rehearsing with the people of Israel the history of how God had delivered them and brought them to the brink of the promised land. That's what chapter 24 is all about. In the middle of this historical review, I want you to read with me verses 11 and 12. And ye went over Jordan, and came unto Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them from before you even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with the sword, nor with thy bow. In all of your study of the Old Testament history of the Hebrew people and their conquest of the land of Canaan, how many of you ever noticed that verse? And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with the sword and with the bow. This is not the only instance in which this statement is made. Take your Bibles and turn back to the book of Exodus, chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23, verses 27 and 28. Moses here, the speaker, I will send my fear before thee and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make thine enemies turn their backs unto thee or run from you. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before thee. You see that? I will send hornets before you. Joshua said, I sent the hornet before you. It's not the only case, not, not the only occasion. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Verses 17 through 23. Moses again, If thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but thou shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt the great temptations which thine eyes saw, and the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the stretched out arm whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them until they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed, that thou shalt not be affrighted of them for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God, 
and terrible. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction, until they be destroyed. Again, I will send the hornet before thee. Three times, the Bible says God would send hornets to help fight your battles. The Bible does not say how often these hornets came. But it does make it clear that as the children of Israel fought against these heathen nations, the Girgashites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, etc., that during the course of battle, the Lord would send swarms of hornets into the camp of the enemy. I've done a little bit of research into the type of hornets these were. These were of the variety that we, that we call uh, killer bees. They're not the same genetics, but the same, the same characteristics. These were extremely aggressive hornets. Hornets that could sting multiple times. Hornets that measured somewhere between an inch and a half and two inches long. That would swarm by the tens and hundreds of thousands at once. There was no piece of armor that was impervious to these hornets. They could get underneath the chest plates. They could get underneath the helmets. They could get underneath the clothing. There was no armament or protection that could be worn on the battlefield against the hornets. And at various times, as God's people were in the course of battle, when they were fighting the Hivites or the Gugashites or whoever the ites were at the time that they were fighting, God would, at his own beck and call, and at his his own timing, would send these hordes of hornets upon the enemy troops. They would not be able to fight. They would not be able to stand. They would not be able sometimes to even see. The stings of the hornets would blind them. The stains of the hornets would inflict such pain that they could not hold rank. They would turn their backs to the enemy and run for cover, trying to get away from the hornets. And of course, the Hebrews would come with the army in disarray and with the army not disciplined and would be able to easily overthrow the army on the battlefield. So God reminded them that their victory was not simply through their sword, but it was God's miraculous intervention that gave them the victory on the battlefield. Now, I want want you to notice three things in this message today. The first one is that God had delivered the Hebrews from bondage out of Egypt. Joshua made it very clear in Joshua 24 that God had delivered them from bondage. He did this in two ways. He did this through a mighty man, and he did this through mighty miracles. Moses was the mighty man that God used to go back to Egypt and to demand of Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses was, of course, one of the three greatest men of the Old Testament, the meekest man in all the earth, the judge and lawgiver of Israel. He was, he was God's man for Israel at that time. He was a mighty man. God had to have such a man as Moses to be able to do what had to be done to deliver the people of Israel. 
God always has his men and his women to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Never forget that. God used a mighty man. The second thing, he used mighty miracles. You know the story how God brought plague after plague after plague upon the land of Israel until finally the last plague resulted with the death of the firstborn and the children of Israel were delivered, were delivered from bondage. So God had delivered the Hebrews from the bondage of Egypt through a mighty man and through mighty miracles. Folks, God has delivered us from the bondage of sin through a mighty man, the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, each of us, are nothing more than sinners deserving death, needing a Savior. It doesn't matter how good you think you are or aren't, we're all sinners that need a Savior. It had to be the sinless, perfect Lamb of God that would go to the cross and die for our sins. No one else was qualified to do this. I could not die for your sins, nor you for mine, because we're all made of Adam's flesh and Adam's blood. But Jesus came as the only begotten Son of God. And as Jesus only begotten, as God's only begotten Son, Jesus shed his royal, rich, perfect blood on the cross for our sins, satisfying the law of God doing what you and I could not do, dying in our place, offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And if you've already received Christ as your Savior and you've experienced the joy of salvation, thank God for the mighty man, Jesus Christ. He delivered us through the mighty man, Jesus, and he also delivered us through the miracles, the mighty miracles. That would be the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Jesus proving that he was not just a mere man, not a martyr, not simply a good example, but he was a savior, dying for our sins, rising again on the third day, proving that he was, as he claimed, God in flesh. So God delivered us from the bondage of sin through Christ and the miracle of his resurrection. Now, now listen carefully, because I'm, I'm going to be going back and forth in this message. And hopefully by the time I'm finished, you'll see how I've woven this together. For the individual, for the individual, look, I just compared the physical deliverance of the Hebrews out of bondage by the hand of Moses with the deliverance from sin that Jesus has given us. One is a literal physical deliverance. The second is a spiritual deliverance. For the individual, for the individual, for you as an individual, for me as an individual, spiritual deliverance is the most important deliverance of all. Amen. Dying for your country will not save your soul. Being a good patriot will not save your soul. Fighting for political freedom will not save your soul. Joining the church will not save your soul. Trying to keep the Ten Commandments will not save your soul. The only thing that will save your soul is faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need that redemption individually, 
personally more than you did anything else. Even if the forces of tyranny were to conquer us, they could never take away the deliverance and the freedom that Jesus has given to our hearts through what he did on the cross of Calvary. So what is more important than that to you personally? Jesus said, what what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What does it profit you? Whatever you gain in this world, only to die without Christ, lost and undone, So spiritual deliverance, the deliverance and the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ for you and I as individuals is the most important deliverance of all. I urge you, whoever you are watching right now live or even as we archive this message and you watch it later on video, or whether you're right here in front of me, if you have never come to that place where you by faith have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, accepting the salvation and redemption that he offers freely by what he did on the cross and his resurrection, I urge you today to in humility bow your heart to the Lord and claim him as your Savior and God. There's nothing more important to you as an individual than that. But for the nation, for the nation, political deliverance is the most important. This is where so many of our Christian friends do not understand at all the issues that face us in this regard. God doesn't save, I'm talking spiritually, God doesn't save nations. I keep hearing these, God save America. What do you mean? What does that mean? God doesn't save nations. God saves people. Individuals. You came into this world as an individual soul. You sit in this audience as an individual soul. You are going to die and meet God one day as an individual soul. God wants to save your soul. God doesn't save nations. God saves people. God can and will deliver nations from bondage and give them freedom, liberty, an opportunity. That's what God did for the nation of Israel under Moses. God gave them a political deliverance, a physical deliverance. They were slaves. They were bound in hard labor. They were enslaved to a harsh dictatorship at the hand of Pharaoh. God sent Moses and miracles upon the land And he delivered them physically, politically, from the land of Egypt and gave them liberty and freedom as a nation. That's political deliverance. And as a country, as a nation, the most important thing for us is that natural 
physical, political liberty that God wants to give us. And make no mistake about it, the same God that saves individually is the same God that delivers politically. It is a gift of God. Liberty is a gift of God. As salvation is a gift of God, as life is a gift of God, it is all the gift of God. I hear these Christians say, well, all we're supposed to do is preach the gospel and get people saved, and if we just get people saved, everything will be all right. Really? We have been preaching the gospel the last half of the 20th century in a way that has never been done in the history of the church. There's been more missionaries sent, more gospel preaching, more radio broadcasts, television broadcasts, printed material, tracts, Bibles, more Bible schools, colleges, universities, seminaries. There has been more gospel work that has taken place over the last half of the 20th century than in any time in church history. 2,000 years. There has never been the kind of proliferation of Bible preaching and gospel preaching than we've had in this country over the last 50 to 60 years. So, pray tell, why are we now on the verge of tyranny in this land? If preaching the gospel was the sole solution to the political deliverance of a nation, pray tell, why are we where we are as a country? Why do we have the problems that we have today internally? Why are we dealing with the assault against our liberties, our Bill of Rights, the essential freedoms that we all enjoy. Why are we battling left and right from every side? It seems like no matter where you are, you turn around on one day and the assault comes from over here. And the next minute it comes from over here. And then it comes from over here. You can't keep up with the assaults against our liberties. Where has all the gospel preaching gotten us in terms of political deliverance? Nowhere. Because it takes more than preaching the gospel to give political freedom to a nation. When Moses went to Pharaoh, he just didn't go and say, hey, brother Pharaoh, God wants to save you. I've got a good message for you, Pharaoh, today. Woo! God loves you. God wants to save you, Pharaoh. God wants to prosper you. He wants you to enjoy health and wealth and prosperity. Was that the message that Moses brought to Pharaoh? Moses came to Pharaoh and said, let the slaves go free. And if you don't let the slaves go free, buddy, God is going to judge you big time. Here's an example. <clears throat> water turns to blood. Right? Amen. It wasn't just the gospel that freed the slaves in Israel. It was a mighty man of courage who took the message of liberty. Let my people go to Pharaoh. And through divine intervention and the help of God in performing judgmental miracles upon the land of Egypt, Pharaoh finally relented and, and let the people go free.
you see, there's two kinds of deliverance. There's the individual spiritual deliverance that comes from the gospel of Christ that applies to the human heart and the human soul of man. And then there's the political deliverance that God wants to give to a people corporately, collectively, as a nation, to give us liberty and peace and freedom. God does not want us laboring under the bondage of sin, and he doesn't want us laboring under the bondage of slavery either. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Free spiritually, free politically, free nationally. The total encumbrance of freedom. Old Testament Israel is called the church in the wilderness. Acts chapter 7 verse 38. The church in the wilderness. Spiritually, it typifies and illustrates the church. There are so many lessons for the church from Old Testament Israel. So many spiritual applications to the church from Old Testament Israel. Plus, in a very superintending providential sort of way, it parallels U.S. history so often. America's colonial pastors used the Old Testament Israel to illustrate the church and the American nation. I challenge you to go back and read the great messages of the colonial era pastors, and you'll see how they so often used Old Testament Israel to illustrate and describe the church on the one hand, spiritually, but then also the American Republic, on the other hand, politically. And the analogies and the illustrations were drawn from Old Testament Israel in both regards. Now, number two. After being delivered from bondage, the Hebrews had to fight many enemies. But they did not fight alone. God fought with them. Okay? God delivered them from bondage. There's a spiritual bondage that we all are subject to as sinners that we need deliverance from Christ. Then there was the political bondage that the nation of Israel was enduring at the hands of the Egyptians. God delivered them by a mighty hand from bondage. But after they were delivered from bondage, they had to fight many enemies. But they did not fight alone. God fought with them. Spiritually, we have to face many enemies. But child of God, we never have to face a single enemy alone. Temptations, you're not alone. Loneliness. You're not alone. Separation. You're not alone. Sickness. Suffering. Setbacks. Disappointments. Discouragements. We have to face all these things. But as a Christian, we don't face them alone, thank God. Persecutions. Heartaches, financial hardships, desertions, sinful failures. None of us are perfect. Betrayals. These are all spiritual enemies that fight against us. And as Christians, we must face these enemies one at a time. But we never have to face them alone. God will help us fight the spiritual enemies that we face every day. And I'm starting to get warm now. I don't know about anybody else. But if anybody, if you're going through, if you're going through 
a, a serious trial of some sort, financial, marital, vocational, health, separation, persecution, whatever you're facing, Christian friend, whatever you're facing, you are not alone. Jesus said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And listen, he has not left you, and he has not forsaken you. You are not alone. Doesn't mean that you're not going to face temptation, or betrayal, or financial problems, or sickness, or disappointment, or discouragement. Doesn't mean that at all. It just means that whenever we must, be, must engage these enemies, that God is there to fight our battles with us. He will not leave us comfortless. He will not leave us alone. But as a free people, as a nation, we must also fight many enemies, must we not? The enemies of freedom are ubiquitous. Not everybody loves freedom. And people that don't love it for themselves certainly don't love it for somebody else. We fight them all the time. Enemies of freedom are everywhere. Statists, socialists, fascists, corporatists, Warfarists, Zionists, militant Islamists, environmentalist extremists, animal rights extremists, anti-Christian extremists, warmongers, big government toadies, anti-gun zealots, control freaks, globalists, on and on and on. The enemies of freedom are everywhere. We must face them. We must resist them. And as God put his hand of deliverance upon Moses and the people of the Hebrews under Pharaoh, God wants to put his hand of deliverance upon his people today. By the way, our Senator Max Baucus, talk about globalists, our Senator Max Baucus just recently voted to put the United States under the United Nations Small Arms Treaty. In my opinion, sir, Mr. Baucus, you are a traitor to the Constitution and the people of the United States of America. I hope and pray the people of Montana will reward Mr. Baucus for that vote whenever he's up for re-election in November of next year. By the way, to give credit where credit's due, Senator John Tester voted against the United States going into the UN Small Arms Treaty. Thank you, Senator Tester, for your, for your vote. But we're not fighting alone. We're not fighting alone. God has his 7,000 who will not bow to Baal. And the 7,000 does not mean literal 7,000. It could be many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. It means that however many people are necessary, God has them scattered in the country. The salt has been sprinkled in the land. We are there at his bidding. So, God delivered the Hebrews from Egypt. The spiritual deliverance of what Christ did for us on the cross. Receiving him as Savior. The freedom that only Christ can give. The political freedom where the people came out of bondage as a nation and the national freedom that God wants to give and did give to our country 
through the great men that God raised up in 1775 and 1776, God brought America out of political bondage into a land of freedom and opportunity. Secondly, after being delivered, there's a lot of enemies to fight. Just because you've been saved doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems. Doesn't mean that you're going to be left alone by Satan and his minions. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have challenges. You're going to have to face these enemies. You're going to have to face these challenges. But listen, child of God, you're not alone. The Holy Spirit of God indwells you. He will never lead you. He will never forsake you. He's there to help you in your spiritual battles. In our political battles. To retain the freedom that has been bequeathed to us by others who were brave enough to fight for it. We must be able and willing to fight to maintain the freedom that God has given to us through the sacrifice of others. If there's going to be freedom, political freedom, given to the next generation and the one after that, it's going to be because that those of us who love freedom now are willing to fight to retain that freedom now. It's, it's not something that is taken for granted or just something that automatically goes into the next generation. It's got to be earned and preserved each generation. Now, point number three, God sent hornets upon Israel's enemies. Come on, how many of you, all the sermons and all the time you've studied about the children of Israel fighting the battles of Canaan after they've come out of, how many of you heard the first thing about the hornets? How many, how many have heard the first thing about the hornets? Two people? Three people? Nobody talks about the hornets. Three times. The Bible says God sent hornets to the enemy. Boy, how'd you like to have been a Gergeshite? And you're, you got your battle plan and you got your strategy and you got your armor and you spent five hours, you know, getting all that armor on. Worse than a woman putting on her makeup. And... <laughs> Sorry. Hours and hours to get ready for battle. The, the commanders all met together and they said, Boy, we're gonna, we got, here's our strategy, here's what we're gonna do. We got it all planned out. Everybody's in position. Everything's ready to go. The, the enemy's approaching. The zero hour is upon you. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the sun is blackened by the horde of hornets that just come from nowhere. And they are aggressively biting and stinging you. They're getting inside your helmet. They're getting inside your, 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 your clothes, inside your, your armor. They're getting inside your clothing. They're, they're attacking your eyes. You can't see. You can't hear. All you hear is the buzzing of hundreds of thousands of insects. The biting is going on. The, 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 your, your face is beginning to swell as the poison begins to take effect. And... All of a sudden, you don't know where you are. Where am I? Am I, am I? I'm supposed to be over here. I don't even know where I am. Where's the guy next to me? Everything's in disarray. Everything's confusion. And the next thing you know, you're dead. Because the Hebrew sword just chopped off your head while you were too busy trying to fight the hornets. God sent the hornets. Now, Israel still had to fight. The hornets were just God's way of assisting the army of the Hebrews. They still had to fight. They still had to put on the armor. They still had to pick up the shield and the sword. The archers still had to be at the ready. They still had to fight, but they did not fight alone. As believers, spiritually, we must be willing to serve the Lord and forsake our strange gods so that God will be pleased to fight for us. Spiritually, as believers, we have to be willing to serve the Lord. You can't be a Christian who doesn't serve God, who doesn't care about what the Lord cares about, who isn't willing to put him first in your life, 
and give him the service and the dedication and the honor that he wants and that he deserves in your life and expect him to bless you. As a Christian, you are obligated to serve the Lord, to follow him, to obey him, to submit to him, to be sensitive to him, to forsake your strange gods so that God will be pleased to help you and assist you and strengthen you and prosper you and bless you. But as freedom lovers, we must be willing also to submit to God's natural law for nations and recognize our creator God as sovereign. Please listen carefully. So many patriots that love freedom, but they don't understand that freedom depends on the acknowledgement of our Creator God and the natural laws that He has given us. Freedom, even political freedom, is a gift of God. It is a provision from the Lord. Now please please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that everybody who fights for freedom must be a born-again Christian. I'm not saying that at all. There are many people that are ardent patriots who love liberty as much as I do, who are willing to fight for the principles of liberty as much as I am or anyone else, but that who do not understand that freedom is a gift of God and that as such, it is dependent upon the acknowledgement of our Creator God and the natural laws that He has established. You cannot ignore the Creator God and the natural law, the laws that apply to nations and nationhood and the natural laws of men. You cannot ignore that and expect that there would be true liberty at the same time. You don't have to be a born-again Christian. You don't have to go to a Baptist or Pentecostal or Lutheran church. You don't have to subscribe to a particular tenet of Christian denomination. That's not what I'm saying. But you do have to understand that Freedom and liberty is a gift of our Creator. And that our Creator has established certain natural laws upon which liberty and freedom are founded. You do have to understand that. Or there is no lasting liberty. Listen to James Madison. Father of the Constitution, chief, one of the chief authors of the Federalist Papers, President of the United States. It is the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage before any man can be considered a member of civil society, he must first be considered as a subject of the governor of the universe, close quote. Did you catch that? Before we can be considered a member of a civil society, a free society, a peaceful society, we must be considered a subject of the governor of the universe. 
Understanding that God is sovereign over the affairs of men. Understanding that our Creator God has established laws upon which liberty is based and built. Benjamin Franklin, not known to be one of the most spiritual of the founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin said this, Here is my creed. I believe in one God, the creator of the universe, that he governs by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped. Close quote. You see that? All of the founders understood this. Even the ones that would not consider themselves Christian or would categorize themselves as Christian. The ones that didn't go to church every Sunday. The ones who didn't claim membership in a Christian denomination. They all understood the principle that I'm sharing with you now. The divine providential superintending grace of our creator over the affairs of men is intricate to the liberty of a people. So when God fights with us and for us, he sends hornets to plague and afflict our enemies. Do you believe that? How many of you have seen the, the World War II movie, Steve McQueen, several other good actors, The Great Escape? Let me see now. Good movie. True story. You know where the, the real great escape, I think, was George Washington's great escape. Are you familiar with it? As a young soldier, Washington recognized the hand of God on him personally. Describing his battle experiences in a letter to a friend, Washington wrote this. By the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I've been protected beyond all human probability or expectations. I've had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot out from under me yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. By the way, later on, after that, one of those famous uh, Indian battles, one of the chiefs uh, went on public record to describe his side of that battle. And he had said that in order to win the day, his, his soldiers, his Indians, had to kill the great white leader, which was George Washington. And he had his best marksman in the tribe doing nothing except aiming directly at George Washington. And they fired scores and scores of bullets directly aimed at George Washington by several of these, of these Indian sharpshooters and not one time was George Washington hit. And that's what he was describing when he said four bullets went through his coat, two horses were shot out from underneath him, but not one drop of blood was shed by a bullet fired in his direction. The superintending hand of divine protection upon General Washington. Deep personal faith in God led Washington to accept command of the Continental Army at the outbreak of the American Revolution in 1776. He knew the outcome of the war would affect not only the rebelling colonists, but unseen future generations as well. On July 2nd, 1776, two days before the signing of the Declaration, General Washington stirred his troops with these words, quote, the fate of unborn millions will now depend under God on the conduct and the courage of this army. Our cruel and unrelenting enemy leaves us only the choice of brave resistance or the most abject submission. We have therefore to resolve to conquer or die. 
That doesn't sound like a pacifist to me. That doesn't sound like a Romans 13, well, God's in control, then there's nothing that we're supposed to do about it, to me. The events of one extraordinary day, just a month later after he said those words, confirmed Washington's faith and demonstrated the miraculous intervention of God in the course of America's destiny. Faced with the fact of America's declared independence, the British military command determined that the key to suppressing the rebellion lay in the domination of New York. Whichever army controlled access to the Hudson River controlled the lines of supply for the colonies north and south. Under the command of General William Howell, the British quickly established a formidable presence in New York. Their only impediment was the American-held town of Brooklyn. It was here on the western end of Long Island that General Washington found himself surrounded, outnumbered, more than three to one, by a better trained, better equipped enemy. However, when circumstances seemed to spell certain defeat, a miraculous series of events began to unfold. This is a matter of history. Amazingly, the very capable and seasoned General Howe failed to capitalize on his obvious military advantage. Throughout the afternoon and evening, the following morning, Washington's forces tensed for an attack, which never came. By the afternoon of August 28, northeast winds drove a chilling rain across the East River, preventing the British fleet from launching any offensive maneuver whatsoever. Inspired by the delay, Washington formulated a daring strategy of escape. Under the storm's cover, he began to remove his beleaguered army by small boats, enabling them to join other American forces a full mile behind enemy lines. As night fell, the inclement weather dissipated, and still Washington's army continued its evacuation without detection. But as the morning sun dawned, the Americans calculated that at least three more hours were needed to transport the last of the 8,000 troops to safety. What happened next is best described by one who was actually there. Major Ben Talmage, a member of the Continental Army, gave this eyewitness testimony. At this time, a very dense fog began to rise, and it seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this providential occurrence perfectly well. It was so very dense as the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. We tarried until the sun had risen, but fog remained as dense as ever. What the British discovered when the fog lifted was an empty and abandoned encampment of Washington's armor army, which had seemed to vanish, along with their provisions, cannons, and horses. Instead of defeat, the Americans experienced a temporary setback and regrouped to fight on a future successful day. General George Washington recognized God's hand on his life during the Revolutionary War. He said the following, I was but the humble agent of a favoring heaven whose benign influence was so often manifested in our behalf and to whom the praise of victory alone is due. Close quote. In Washington's case, God didn't send hornets. He sent fog. The result was the same. The enemies of freedom were defeated, and God's people were delivered, and liberty was granted to a nation. But Israel still had to fight. Washington still had to fight. We still have to fight. God is not going to provide victory to indifferent, lethargic, spineless people. In our spiritual lives, we have to fight. Prayer and Bible reading is a fight. Have you tried it? Witnessing for Christ is a fight. Being faithful in our service and in our stewardship is a fight. Giving sacrificially of our tithes and offerings is a fight. Being faithful amidst formidable circumstances is a fight. Standing for truth when you're all by yourself is a fight. Crucifying your flesh to do what God would have you do and not what you want to do is a fight. Resisting Satan is a fight 
The Christian life is a fight. You have to fight. In our national life, we have to fight. Daniel Webster said, God grants liberty only to those who love it and are always ready to guard and defend it. If you're not willing to guard and defend it, you're not going to have it. George Washington said, The thing that separates the American Christian from every other person on earth is the fact that he would rather die on his feet than to live on his knees. Close quote. Josiah Quincy II was a Revolutionary War era attorney, a pro-independence leader. In fact, uh, you may not be aware of this, he was the principal spokesman for the Sons of Liberty in Boston. Did you know that? Josiah, Josiah Quincy, the principal spokesman for the Sons of Liberty in Boston. Here's what he said. Blandishments will not fascinate us, nor will threats of a halter intimidate For under God we are determined that wheresoever, whensoever, or howsoever we shall be called to make our our exit, we will die free men. They had to fight. They couldn't just sit back and say, well, God's going to deliver us. God's going to give us freedom and liberty. God's going to defeat our enemies. God sent the hornets as the Hebrews picked up the sword and marched to battle. That's when God sent the hornets. That's when God sent the fog. That's when God sent the flood. That's when God sent the supernatural protection and provision of his his people. You're not going to know the miracle if you never get the battle. God isn't going to perform a miracle for you while you're sleeping in your bed. Okay, let's recap. The Hebrews had to do what? They had to believe and trust God. They had to forsake their strange gods. And they had to pick up their swords and fight. What did God do? God sent the hornets on the enemy. And God gave victory to his people. In our spiritual life, in our spiritual life, what do we have to do? We have to believe and trust God. We have to forsake our strange gods. And we have to pick up our swords and fight spiritually. What about in our national life? What do we have to do? We've got to believe and trust God. We've got to forsake our strange gods. And we've got to pick up our swords and fight. And when we do, the Lord will send hornets to the camp of the enemy. Let's stand for prayer.